Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so my si sincere thanks to Mark uh, Donfried for inviting me to this uh, international conference. Uh, and so I have chosen to speak uh, um, about literature as a bridge between people and cultures, and I will try to explain why literature and translation open the way to mutual understanding. First, um, it is obvious that some books changed the world, allowing everybody, whatever their culture, references, uh, certainties and doubts, to ponder over fundamental issues concerning man, his being, his imagination, his hopes, and his rights. Don Quixote by Cervantes, for instance, is one of the most influential and popular novels to emerge from Spain. The adventure, symbolism, and characterization contained in, his no in this novel has promoted this book to uh, the popularity it still enjoys uh, today, and it continues to inspire uh, others to create movies and stories. Uh, um, another example is 1984 by Orwell. The themes in this novel has become a major part of modern culture, um, as have terms such as Big Brother and Double Speak, uh, resulting from Orwell's term of double think. A last example is Things Fall Apart uh, by Chinua Achebe. Uh, in this novel, the theme of preserving uh, cultural history in the face of Western domination gave voice to the oppressed in Africa and caught the attention of the world. Uh, the novel, written in 1958, uh, is still widely read and studied as an example of the damage of colonialism. Second, I've been teaching English literature for many years at the Sorbonne, and I can see every day how much uh, it means to students, uh, not only because it's part of their curriculum, but also because literature, be it in French, uh, in foreign languages, or in translations, um, opens up mental and cultural spaces which students are obviously fully aware of. As a matter of fact, uh, most of us would not be able to read Dostoevsky, Strindberg, Anderson, or Mishima unless we read them in translation. Reading um, translated literature is vital for education in the humanities and also for our general knowledge of the world. As Anthony Burgess put it, translation is not a matter of words only, it is a matter of making intelligible a whole culture. Um, concerning translation, it is now agreed uh, that translators are importers uh, adapting and recreating texts for a local audience. The notion of translation is not new, and uh, studying its history shows how much it has mattered to men from the antiquity uh, onwards. However, the Greeks were no real translators, probably because in Europe, uh, their country was the bedrock of civilization, a country where various forms of literature were born. Ancient Greeks considered the uh, other peoples as barbarians, uh, and their feeling of superiority was based uh, on the inner belief that their culture was more refined uh, than their neighbors and that their language was far above the others. There were, however, exceptions. One of them can be found in one of Plato's dialogues, uh, Critias. In 390 BC, Plato went to Egypt, uh, and in this dialogue, he mentioned Solon, an Athenian politician, who traveled to Egypt uh, in 600 BC, where he was told by local priests about the legend of Atlantis, uh, which the Greeks had forgotten because, unlike the Egyptians, they had no historical tradition. The fact is that the narrative of Atlantis, the mythical continent that mysteriously disappeared and that still appeals very much to our imagination, um, um, this um, story is uh, a story, therefore, that was brought back uh, by Solon to Greece. Uh, and uh, it, of course, contradicts the idea that the Greeks were no translators, and it was a translation, actually. Another example is the case of Herodotus, uh, uh, the Greek historian who traveled to Egypt in the fourth century BC and who translated a few narratives that he inserted into his own works. Yet, translation in Greece, um, had it been developed and institutionalized, might have been related to Hermes, uh, the Greek god uh, whose name means interpreter or messenger, a god who is not only his fellow, his fellow god's messenger, but also a traveling go-between, who was in charge of negotiations and trade. His function, highly symbolic, has been since frequently alluded to in writings about translation. In other words, Hermes was a translator. The first European translator whose name is known to us uh, is uh, a man called Livius Andronicus, a former Greek slave, uh, 
uh, who uh, translated the Odyssey into Latin and in verse. Uh, from this time on, lots of Latin authors used Greek original texts and uh, they translated them and um, more or less accurately, actually, or at least they reused them for personal recreations. Things moved on with the dramatic emergence of Christianity. Christ was born in a plurilingual environment whose variety appears at least partly in the sign that was nailed uh, on the cross. According to John the Apostle, it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. And it's quite likely that Christ spoke Aramaic and that it was in that language that he preached. Yet the Gospels were written in Greek, maybe in Hebrew in the case of Matthew, and some scholars think that the Gospels as transcripts from the Aramaic, the language of Christ's oral teaching, are a translation. In other words, the evangelists were the first Christian translators. Everybody, of course, is now aware of their international success. The Middle Ages was a long period of changes as regards translation. Uh, maybe less in the West, uh, which, strived, which strived to preserve fragments of vanishing age, uh, than uh, in the Middle East uh, with the Arab civilization from the late 8th century onwards. Thanks to translation, notably, a massive transfer of knowledge took place from the Middle East to the West uh, as early as the 10th century, but it was not before the reconquest that Spain discovered it mainly through Arabic translations of Greek works, as well as through original Arabic writings. Italy was quite active with Florence as a thriving center of production. French translations of foreign works were encouraged by King Charles V, but Britain, naturally bilingual, under the reign of William the Conqueror and his successors, developed translations of texts into English. Later, Chaucer was interested in transcultural fertilization, and at least 250 French words can be found in his own works. A century later, Mallory uh, borrowed massively from French texts in his own Morte d'Arthur, based on myth of the legend of King Arthur, thus acknowledging his debt and confessing that nothing could be achieved without taking foreign influences and cultural innovations into account. The Renaissance re-examined the hierarchy of languages. Although the prestige of Greek and Latin, which was the language of science and law, was still huge, yet uh, many were still aware of the necessity of putting vernacular languages into the foreground, and for the first time, Leonardo Bruni, or Leonardo Aretino, his other name, uh, who was an Italian humanist historian and statesman, introduced the verb traducere, the Latin word, in the modern sense of translating. That's the first time the word appeared. In the 17th century, translating ancient texts meant adapting them to the flavor of the day. It also implied that interest for European authors developed. Uh, for instance, under the reign of Catherine II, Catherine the Great, uh, who was, as you know, a German princess, uh, Translators got grants from the state, and in 768, she created what was called a society promoting the translation of foreign culture, which produced 112 translations. Catherine was also very much interested in language, generally speaking, and she was fond of a book written by a French author who demonstrated, or at least tried to demonstrate, uh, that all languages had common roots, uh, which politically implied that language and international communication abolished borders. All that contributed to the evolution of ideas. Moldavian translators took an important part in the spreading of French culture, for instance. Transylvanians were more attracted by German literature, although little by little other countries, uh, such as Romania, became more and more open to English and Italian influences, amongst others. The Enlightenment was a particularly fertile age, uh, and Romanticism was later a major turn. Thus, Goethe, the German poet, uh, elaborated a theory of translation in the service of Weltkultur, Weltliteratur, uh, as an opening onto the world. French and English authors were massively translated into German, and The Thousand and One Nights uh, was a major bestseller all around Europe in French, English, and German translations. 
the East, although reimagined in uh, the Thousand and One Nights, uh, had become an area of interest, uh, and the fascination for Oriental culture, art, and civiliza civilization developed while Europe was undergoing substantial political and cultural transformations. The model was no longer, or at least not only, that of all Europe, and the emergence of America in the 19th century confirmed that feeling. The 19th century developed the conception of translation as a window onto, open to the outside world, no longer simply foreign or strange, uh, but closer to us. The European space became a place for exchanges and sharing experiences, although nationalistic uh, ideological reservations went on developing. The 20th and 21st centuries have known and still know a remarkable development of translation throughout the world. All languages are concerned, and translation largely, largely contributes to globalization, as anything that is written anywhere becomes available and readable. I will simply give a personal example. As Mark said, uh, recently I translated a contemporary Indian poet uh, into French, uh, and the book was published in September, so quite recently. The poet is called Arun Kolatkar, a major Indian voice, a major voice in Indian uh, poetry, contemporary poetry. He wrote in English and in Hindi. And uh, um, a poet I discovered, by the by, such thanks to a student of mine who is writing her PhD uh, about uh, contemporary Indian poetry uh, under my supervision at the time. Uh, personally, I have never been to India, but reading Kolatkar's works um, and translating him allowed me not only to understand some aspects of modern India, and more particularly of Bombay, where the poet spent uh, his whole life, but also to learn what related him to other parts of the world and to other poets and writers in what is now often referred to as the global village. I do not mean that Kalatkar saw himself as a citizen of the world, which is a time-worn phrase, and I'm not even sure that, politically speaking, the idea appealed to him. I mean simply that men of letters and artists uh, were to him all interrelated. One day, when asked by an interviewer who, was, uh, who his favorite poets and writers were, he set out a large uh, multilingual list. And the answer, of course, is partly buff, but the list is indicative of the wide, fragmented sources he had in mind, and it's worth quoting in full. It's a very funny list because it's a list of uh, all kinds of authors, not just writers, but also actors. So the list is Whitman, Eliot, Pound, Auden, Hart, Crane, Dylan, Thomas, Kafka, Baudelaire, Heine, Catullus, uh, um, uh, Wang Wei, Tu Fu, Han Shan, Honaji, Mandelstam, Dostoevsky, Gogol, uh, Apollinaire, Breton, Brecht, uh, Neruda, Gainsbourg, uh, uh, Gunther Grass, Norman Mailer, uh, etc., Bob Dylan, Sylvia Plath, Ted Hughes, uh, Hopkins, uh, um, Vajda, Kurosawa, Eisenstein, Truffaut, Woody Guthrie, Laurel, and Hardy. And that's the, the list he gave. And of course, uh, the list is itself poetry because of the uh, accumulation. But I think that here, Kalatkar is not simply paying homage to international artists, whatever their field, uh, poetry, drama, fiction, cinema, music, and so on. He's also showing that first, uh, there's no hierarchy in, cultural, uh, in human cultural productions. And second, that the musical impact uh, of names matters at least as much as what they actually refer to. Um, naturally, uh, it is uh, essential uh, that uh, we should learn uh, languages. A language is not just vocabulary, grammar, and syntax. Uh, it also involves being, thought, and national culture. And I've tried to, I've tried to show that uh, translated literature had and has a great potential to bridge cultures and bring different segments of hum humanity closer to, each, uh, closer to each other. Uh, I would like to give you very briefly um, 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 quotation. It's a very nice um, uh, African uh, story. Um, I'm trying to find the page because I'm getting a little mixed up there. Um, yes, um, sorry, because I decided that it was too long. Right, so that's it. Yes, um, I, I have in mind um, an African tale, uh, which I, I read recently. And um, the, the, the title of the, the tale is The Reason Why the Crab Has a Shell. 
So it's a rather long tale, but at the end of the story, an old woman is trying to kill a crab, to hit and kill a crab, which bravely resists and manages to save its own life. So that's the short paragraph at the end of the tale. The crab jumped sideways and shouted at the old lady. Of course, I read it in translation. Hey, what? What are you playing at? Hitting me? You don't know me. Just you wait. The crab dived under the water and started scooping up white sand, splashing it all over the whole lady's head, so that all her hair turned white. She got even more angry, so angry that she just threw the calabash at the crab, which landed on his back and got stuck there. She tried to pull it off, but try as she might, it was stuck hard. The crab groaned and the old lady cursed, but they could not remove it. That's why when you see a crab now, it's got a hard shell on its back, and when you see an old lady, her hair is white all over. The story is beautiful, and it is a happier ending for the crab, but the conclusion goes further than immediate satisfaction and relief. Quite poetically, it shows that whatever the origin of the story, here, Africa, the same universal doubts and questions are raised by man. The hard shell of the crab can be read as a metaphor for the world's resistance to interpretation, although interpretation is what man needs and longs for. The explanation about the woman's white hair can be analyzed uh, as a reassuring way of showing children all over, all around the world, that age, which is part of experience and nature, should not be considered as a personal tragedy, just a natural thing, as natural as the white sand splashed over the woman's head. International literature and myth contribute to clear up, through imagination, the mystery of the real. The last word I will, I will say, um, uh, my conclusion is, uh, as I said, that uh, learning languages and translating languages is essential because all these story, all the stories we can read are part uh, of our universal culture. And um, I would like to quote uh, a French poet uh, um, because our, uh, this poet is a very famous man, uh, Saint John Pers, who got uh, uh, the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1960. And uh, uh, he uh, insisted, uh, or, of course, that poetical imagination opens up a new kind of humanism, free and universal. He also said that uh, uh, his answer to the question, because it's a question that was very often uh, raised, uh, the question was, why do you write? And uh, he, his answer to the question, why do you write, uh, was simply to live a better life. And I think that the same answer could be given to the question, why do you read, uh, and why do you read translations? And then I would add, to live, and to quote Sanjay Bears, to live a better life with my fellow human beings. Thank you.